QSO Today, Episode 380, Jack Purdom, W8TEE. My thanks to ICOM America for sponsoring the QSO Today podcast. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth, amateur call sign for Zulu One Uniform Golf, where I demonstrate the diversity and relevance of the amateur radio hobby and its impact on society by interviewing ham radio operators, many of whom played vital roles in shaping our technology through the amateur radio hobby. And while many people might say, ham radio, do people still do that? This podcast demonstrates through in-depth interviews just how amazing, diverse, and dynamic the amateur radio hobby continues to be. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo returns on March 12, 2022. If you have a ham radio subject that you'd like to present at the expo, please use the link on the show notes page to get to the expo website and click on the Call for Speakers and Presentations box. In addition, we've created a copper-level sponsorship to allow your radio club, organization, or small business to appear as an exhibitor in the Expo. If you'd like to extend the reach of your organization, please consider coming to the Expo as a sponsor. Dr. Jack Purdom, W-A-T-E-E, licensed since 1954, is a prolific author of at least 17 books on computer programming languages and microprocessor projects for amateur radio, and is now the microcontroller editor of CQ Magazine. This episode is part of my series of interviews to introduce you to QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo speakers. Jack and Al Peters, AC8GY, gave a presentation last August 2021 on building HF single sideband CW software defined transceiver. I'm pleased to have W8TEE as my QSO Today. W8TEE, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Jack? This is W-A-T-E-E, Jack Purdom, sitting in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Jack, thanks for joining me at the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? You know, I, I anticipated that question, and I tried to think about it. And I went back to my uncle, Farn, who gave me a crystal set. I think I was probably seven or eight years old. And I just fell in love with that thing. It was the old oatmeal box wrapped with wire and a Galena crystal and a cat's whisker. And I built that thing up and he helped me. And I just fell in love with it. And then fast forward about three years, um, maybe 10 years old. And I was in Cub Scouts and we went over to a ham radio station run by W8FTQ, Chuck Ziegler. And um, I knew nothing about ham radio at the time. And he said he was going to talk to his son on the radio. So about a half a dozen dozen of us went over to his house on a Sunday morning. And he was fiddling around with all of this beautiful equipment, which turned out to be Collins S-Line. And um, all of a sudden, I heard him say something. I don't even remember the call. And the guy came back and said, hi, Dad. And so they started talking, and um, some of us got on the microphone and said hello to his son. And then when he got done, I asked him where he was, and his son was in South Africa. And I thought, oh, my goodness, this is really cool. So I became kind of a Chuck Ziegler groupie. And then uh, Chuck gave me my novice license uh, when I was 11. So I got my novice in 1954. And I've been licensed continually ever since. At the time, that was a novice license only limited to one year? Correct. I got my general. That was another story. Um, Charlie McEwen and I studied uh, for the general together. He got his license about the same time, his novice about the same time I did. And we lived in Medina, Ohio, which is about 30 miles south of Cleveland. And uh, both of us at age 11, well, actually, I turned 12. We got on the bus and rode into Cleveland and went to uh, the federal building in downtown Cleveland, went up to this room, and it was that typical government green that you've all seen on the walls of government buildings. And we took a chair. It was like a school desk with a writing arm on it. And there was a lectern on the front with this box. And a man came in and, and looked at us and said, um, you'll have five minutes of Morse code coming at you at 13 words per minute. You must copy one 
minute perfectly. And if you do, you'll be allowed to sit for the sending test and then the written exam. And we thought, oh, gee, and I, I know I was scared to death. So anyway, all of a sudden, these notes started coming and whizzing past my ear. And just as I was starting to write the first one down, it ricocheted off the back wall and came back into your ear. Uh, they had the acoustics of a, of a waste can. And um, I was lucky enough to get 13 words per minute correct, or at least one minute of the five minutes correct and past my general. Was he using an instructograph with a paper tape to send you the Morse code? No, I don't believe it was. Um, you know, and I'm not really sure. All I saw was this black box on the front of the table, and I was so scared I didn't pay much attention to it. So what happened after that? What was the novice station before we go on? The first one was uh, built with Chuck, um, my mentor, my Elmer. And that was a two-tube affair that ran 15 watts. And it was modeled after the Amico, uh, which was a kit. I couldn't afford the kit. And Chuck agreed to help me build a transmitter. The receiver was an old Helicrafters S40B. And I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it has a big round dial that you had main tuning and there is a red line uh, that sort of marked the frequency that you were on. That red line covered the entire 40 meter band. So they had a band, uh, what was it called? Band spread tuning. And that was how you tuned in. Once you set the main frequency, you kind of could move around on the, plus or minus, and of course, you're rock bound as a novice. So that was pretty much it, and a 40-meter dipole strung out in the backyard. And how supportive were your parents to your new hobby? Uh, very supportive. Um, my parents always made me buy my own stuff, so this was done on a lawn mowing budget, and I, I think I paid, if I remember correctly, I think the transmitter cost me about $10 to build with Chuck's help. And the receiver was the expensive thing. I paid, uh, I think, $25 for that used. And then the dipole I built out of a uh, 300-ohm twin lead um, with a ballon at the other end. And that was pretty much it. There wasn't a lot of attention paid, I would imagine, to SWR in those days? You know, I'm not even sure I knew what, <laughs> what it was. Um, Chuck told me to cut the dipole and... The 300 ohm twin lead was inexpensive. And as I recall, it was a nine to one ballon or something like that. And it had these, um, Chuck gave me the ballon. And as I recall, it was two big Barker Williamson coils, um, probably four inches in diameter. And uh, the twin lead came into one end and my uh, coax came out and ran into the other end. So, I honestly, I did not have any kind of meter that would even tell me what the SWR was. I was making contact, so I was happy with what I had. Did ham radio play a part in the choices that you made for your career in education? <sighs> That's kind of a sad story. I loved electronics. And um, in the eighth grade, at the end of the eighth grade, you had a meeting with a counselor. And the purpose of that was to decide whether you would go pre-college or you would go vocational. Um, I was raised in a small farming town of about 5,000. And my, you had to go in with your parents and you sat down with this counselor and you mapped out the next three years. And um, he asked me, he said, what do you want to be? And he said, I want to be an electrical engineer. And he looked at me and then he looked at my parents and he said, Jack's not smart enough to be an electronics engineer. So I think he should stay here and fix farm equipment. And my, uh, my parents said, no, he's going to go to college. So a, a follow-up story to that. <clears throat> About uh, 10 years later, we were at Blossom Center outside of Cleveland, Ohio, which is a performing arts center. And I'm walking to the parking lot with my parents. And here comes that high school counselor. He recognized me and he said, Jack. And I said, yes. And uh, he said, 
how are you doing? And I said, I'm doing great. He said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm teaching. He said, you finished college? I said, I did. And he says, where are you teaching? And I said, Creighton University. He goes, you got your master's? And I said, I did. He said, and then he got real serious. And he looked at me. He says, you know, you're going to have to get your PhD to get tenure. And I said, I got that too. And he goes, no shit. (laughs) That was right in front of my parents. And at this time, you know, 40 years ago, people just didn't use that word. So anyway, that was kind of a a fun uh, 10 minutes in a parking lot outside of Cleveland. Well, I think that unfortunately, that kind of counseling is a real shame. Yes, it is. My wife in high school was told that she wasn't smart enough to go to college. She should be a travel agent. Well, my wife has a PhD in education, graduated cum laude from her private college. I'm glad that she didn't listen and that you didn't either. Well, my parents were both college educated, and I knew that I was going to end up going to college. But I'll tell you, that conversation in the eighth grade stuck with me all the way through grad school. And uh, I never had the confidence that maybe I should have had. But the I guess on the upside is I worked perhaps a little harder than I would have otherwise. So I don't know. Um, it was always in the back of my mind, though, and I wish it hadn't been. I think that we sometimes, as adults, forget the power of our words when we speak to young people in any role. I guess maybe if our parents tell us, we don't think about it so much. But if a stranger says it, then for some reason, it seems to stick more. Correct. Correct. So in that case, you actually went on to college. And where did you say you went to college? I went to a small school. uh, We like to say it was a small Christian school for small Christians. Muskingum College at that time. It's Muskingum University now. But it's it's located in southeastern Ohio. And uh, has about, when I was there, about 1,300 students. And it was a really good school. Um, I majored in economics. And uh, there were 23 of us who majored in econ. And at Muskingum, when you graduated, you had to take the GRE, uh, graduate record exam, in your field, even if you weren't going to go to grad school. And to graduate from the school, you had to rank in the 70th percentile or above, or you didn't graduate. So there were 23 of us who took the GRE and econ, and the worst score was the 90th percentile. And 18 of us went on to grad school. It says something very good about the college. I agree. And its students, perhaps. Well, they let me in. I'm not sure. But anyway. You went on for a master's degree? Went on for a master's at Ohio State. And that's another story. Um, I wanted to go to law school. And my advisor at uh, Muskingum said, tell you what, you take the LSAT, the Law School Aptitude Test, and you take the GRE and Econ, and whatever you score better, that's what you should do. Well, he knew that I would just wax the GRE and Econ. And so I applied both to law schools and to grad schools and Econ. And one of them was Ohio State. And what's interesting is my advisor in undergrad was writing back from the Western Economics Association meetings and was sitting on the plane next to Paul Craig, who was the dean at Ohio State, um, or the chairman, rather, of, of the econ department. And they knew each other. And Paul said to my advisor, he said, when are you going to send us a student? And he said, well, we've sent you one and you've accepted him, but he can't go unless he has money. This was on Thursday. On Monday, I got a telegram from Ohio State. I had a full ride with tuition room or books, tuition, and a grant that allowed me to go to grad school. And I've often wondered what would happen, where would I be today if those two hadn't sat on that plane together? What an amazing story, Jack. And then you got your PhD in? Economics. Well, actually, plyometrics. And now this message from ICOM America. Spice up your ham shack with ICOM's IC705. This portable radio is perfect for staying in and venturing out and working your favorite bands this winter season. Happy holidays from ICOM.
The ICOM IC705 is the perfect sidekick and QRP companion. Base station features and functionality at the tip of your fingertips in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at just over 2 pounds, with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 MHz. It has a 4.3-inch touchscreen with live band scope and waterfall display. 5 watts with a BP272, 10 watts with the 13.8 volts DC power supply. Single sideband CW, AM, FM, as well as full D-Star functionality. A touchscreen display, micro USB connector, Bluetooth, and wireless LAN. Integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger. Micro SD card slot speaker microphone using the HM243 and it comes standard. It supports QRP and QRPP operations. The perfect accessory for the IC705 is the optional LC192 backpack with its special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or a day out in the wild. Our family of favorite ICOM amateur radios are also available this holiday season. The IC9700, the IC9300, the IC7610 base stations, the ID52A handheld coming soon, and the ID5100A mobile are the perfect gifts, and it's the most wonderful time of the year to give a gift of ICOM. For more information, click on the ICOM banner in this week's show notes page, and when you purchase your new ICOM rig, please tell your dealer that you heard about it here on QSO Today. And now back to our QSO. Okay, so anybody that's heard the podcast up to this point has heard me introduce you and say that not only are you a doctor in economics now, but you're the author of over 18 books on computer programming, the C programming language. You've written books for Arduino microcontrollers. I think that you're a retired professor of computer technology at Purdue University, or at least that's what your bio says online. So how did you make that transition from economics to computer technology? Well, I was, at the time, we got to go back to about the late 1970s. And I was going to dinner with my wife, and we saw, I, I saw this sign that said, personal computers are here. And I thought, well, that's interesting. So I went back the next day, and it turns out that they were selling kit computers, they were selling the Altair, the Mits, and the Sol 20. And um, I thought I could buy one of those and use it in my consulting because I was doing a lot of uh, economic consulting at the time. And like I said, I was at Butler University. And my ex, my, my wife said that I wasn't, we didn't have enough money to buy one of these kits. They were about $900. And I said, well, what if I build kits? and get enough money that way. And she said, that'd be fine. So that's what I did. And to test them, you have to learn how to program. So I taught myself um, 8080 and Z80 assembler, and I would use that to test the kits that I built. And I found out that I truly loved programming. So that led to more and more programming. Uh, Started out with North Star Basic, then went to Microsoft Basic, and then found the Z or the C programming language and uh, just fell in love with that and wrote my first C book in 1982. And because of those books, that's how I kind of backdoored into the teaching position at uh, Purdue. So you didn't go back for another PhD in computer science? No. Didn't need to. You were probably leading the charge. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't have taken the time to do that. And also Butler was very, very good to me. They allowed me to teach, catch this. I was in the college of business and I told a Z80 assembler programming course. Um, We built about a dozen SOL 20 uh, computers. And if you ever look that up on uh, online, SOL hyphen 20. I already have the reference. It has a keyboard and it looks like a, sort of like an IBM Selectric typewriter. Right. You modified a Hitachi um, 12-inch TV screen to work as the monitor. And we built about a dozen of those and created a College of Business lab 
and we taught um, Excel. Well, back then it was Lotus one, two, three. And uh, we wrote a statistics package and we taught um, statistics uh, using that computer lab. And then the math department got really upset with us and they stole the lab from us. Butler was very nice and very supportive of our efforts to sort of automate the College of Business. Well, in those days, they were, may still have been using mainframes, I would think, right? Well, we had terminals. We had uh, 9,600 baud uh, deck terminals, um, but we only had one for the College of Business, one terminal for the whole College of Business. So that wasn't viable for teaching. And that's why we created the lab. So all of the books then that you wrote up until you retired, with the exception of the amateur radio books, were really based on helping you create computer opportunities for economic majors at your university? That's how it got started, yes. Um, <clears throat> I was stunned. At the time that I wrote my first C book, um, it was called The C Programming Guide in 1982, the only other C book of any consequence out there was the KNR Bible. Um, and I don't know if you've read that book, but I found that pretty tough sledding. And uh, I said, if, if that's tough for me, it's got to be tough for other people. Maybe we could do something to uh, make C a little more approachable. And that book, I don't know if you know it or not, but if you sell 10,000 copies of a technical book, it's considered a success. And the C programming guide went through three editions. Uh, domestically, it sold 237,000 copies, and it was translated into 10 foreign languages. So, And one of those was Chinese, so who knows how many. Well, sadly, Jack, unfortunately, my first introduction to programming was Fortran on cards on an IBM 370. Mine too. So you can imagine if you're ADHD, that for me, that didn't work. It didn't have enough fast enough response time for me. It was, uh, I did the same thing in grad school. I programmed in Fortran for my dissertation research. And I had this deck of cards that you're probably familiar with. that was like five inches thick. Right. I would have to walk from Page Hall over to Robinson Lab, which is about a mile, and you handed your deck in through this little window and this hand came out and took it and you never saw who the hand belonged to. And they would pass you back a piece of paper with a number on it. And then you'd walk back to page hall and you'd start dialing that number. And when your job was done, uh, they would tell you the last job that it would run and you'd go back only to find out you left a comma out. It was awful. And then how many times do you drop that deck and have to put those back in order? But you stuck through it, though. You got a PhD. Yeah, it was. I had to do it to get my union card. And uh, so I stuck with it. And I actually did enjoy programming, always have. Your perseverance shines right through. So you've written all these books on the C language, on computer programming. How did you start evolving into amateur radio? Well, actually, you know what? I think before we do that, before I ask this question, it seems to me that I read someplace that... While you were going through college, you were still a very active ham and on the air. I was. I had, um, when I was in undergrad school, I had a small six-meter rig that they allowed me to put an antenna up on the top of the dorm. And actually, it was, what, six stories up in the air, and we're sitting on top of a hill to begin with. So that was a very, very ideal setup for me. Then I had in grad school, um, I just had a dipole, and I can't remember. I think I still had my DX60 uh, at the time. So I was running a DX60 and a dipole. Um, I forgot what the receiver was. And I did that all the way through grad school. And then when I moved out to Omaha, where Creighton University is, I put up a, a small uh, homebrew 15 meter beam. And I think it was Doug DeMaw, um, his design, it was made out of uh, one by one wood and uh, four pieces of 10 foot conduit and a coil. And that was it. But I was running a GT 550. So I was running up to 500 Watts and running phone patch traffic between off at air force base, which is SAC headquarters in Omaha. 
and their spouses who were on Guam and Marshall Islands in the Pacific. And uh, that was just the most rewarding uh, experience I think I might have ever had in ham radio. And at Christmas, I would have more pies and cakes and cookies and booze than you could shake a stick at. In fact, I would take those into the office every day just to get rid of them. So this was the late 60s, the Vietnam War era? Well, actually, 1970 through 75. Things were heating up and cooling down. I guess by 1975, it started to cool down a little bit, as I recall. Were you affiliated with, say, Army Mars or any of those kinds of organizations running the phone patches, or you just happened to be catching people in the Marshall Islands and Guam who needed phone patches back? It was um, happenstance, but actually, I set up a a regular schedule where I would get on, uh, as I recall, it was um, Tuesdays and Thursdays pretty much at the same time in the same frequency, 15 meter band and 15 back then was just really active. We were in a great part of the sunspot cycle back then. And I think what happened was that on the basis, they heard about it word of mouth and they would show up and give me a phone number and I'd phone patch into their spouse at Offutt. We'd just go from there. Did you have a favorite operating mode in those days? Uh, This was all single sideband. The DX60 uh, was AM, and the GT550 was single sideband. So this was almost all single sideband. In fact, I made a promise to myself when I got my general that I was never going to use CW again. I'm sad to say that I kind of stuck with that promise to myself until I retired in 2009 and discovered QRP and CW again. And now I just really enjoy that mode. How did your ham radio operation continue? Have you always been active? Well, you know, it's that's a relative term. I was very, very active in Omaha. And as the kids started to enter my life, that dropped off. I still operated, but it wasn't like every Tuesday and Thursday. It would be happenstance and catch as catch can. And I pretty much did that until the kids got into school, uh, college. And then I started to have, you know, regular operating hours and so forth. So there was a a period in there of 20 years, I guess, where I was just kind of catch as catch can as far as operating. You bring something up very interesting to me, and that is how important is actually setting aside time to operate? Do you schedule it? Well, no, I never had um, a, a scheduled conference or I'm sorry, scheduled contact with anyone. I would just kind of in my own mind say, I'd like to operate from such and such a time till whenever. And I would do that, but it wasn't regular. It, it would happen when there were gaps in what I was doing in real life, so to speak. So I just operated when I, when I could find the time. And I, I knew that my priority was my family, my job and ham radio. Then would be a, a couple of, ticks down the list, but um, I tried to operate when I could. I want to take a minute to tell you about my favorite podcast, the Ham Radio Workbench Podcast with George, KJ6VU, and now joined by Rod, VA3ON, Mike, VA3MW, Mark, N6MTS, and Vince, VE6LK. Every two weeks, George and company offer up a status report on the many amateur radio projects on their workbenches and explore projects on their guests' workbenches. This group is project active and prolific, covering many technical areas of amateur radio. So the next time you want a deep dive into ham radio electronic project building, or to learn about technology, tools, test equipment, construction techniques, and the rest, Listen to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast, available on every podcast player and channel. Use the link in this week's show notes page to get to the Ham Radio Workbench podcast directly. And now back to my QSO. How did you get involved in building projects using microcontrollers and then writing books to share with the ham radio operators about the things that you were doing with microcontrollers? Well, the book thing, the first, my first C book was published in 1982. And I wrote that because I knew I wanted to teach C in the College of Business. <laughs> and there were no, I didn't think that K&R was appropriate for students who had absolutely no programming experience. 
So I had enough hubris that I thought I could write a book that would be readable, but still cover the C language. So that's how that got started. As far as the microcontroller thing, that happened after I retired. I was in Florida, and a man approached me who knew that I was a programmer and wanted a device. He didn't even know what it would be that would log people in and log people out and record their times of entry and exit from their house. And this would be people like who would dog sit or maybe they're watering plants or whatever when uh, you had the snowbirds coming down to Florida and being there for three months, but then the maintenance that had to go on in the house. And that's when I discovered uh, microcontrollers and what they could do. And what was your first project then? That was it. What did you call it? And did it find commercial success? Uh, You know, it wasn't mine. He paid for it and I turned it over to him and I never gave it a name. I called it, I called it the home register thingy. And the home register thingy was based on what technology? It was based on a push button. There was a timer, a microcontrolled timer that tracked the time and uh, time and day date. And when the person entered, they would enter a code which identified who they were, and that would trigger the timer. And then when they left, they would have to re-enter their code, and uh, that would turn off the clock. And then they would, um, I would record that on an SD card. And the person, when they came back from the north or whatever, could pull that card out and see the comings and goings of the different people. And there could be lawn maintenance people, interior, house plant, uh, you know, the pool guy, whatever. Yeah, when you think about it, there could be a lot of people involved in taking care of a house, right? Well, that was his idea. And, you know, I knew that I was going to walk away from it after it was done, which is what I did. And I really don't know if it ever went commercial or not. What was your first ham radio project using microcontroller? And what was the microcontroller? It was a keyer, an electronic keyer. And that was uh, the Arduino. At that time, it was an Uno. It worked quite well. Then I switched it for to get to a smaller footprint. I switched to the Arduino Nano. And I still do a lot of stuff with the Arduino Nano. That's a nice little processor that has a very small footprint. It's about the size of the first joint of your thumb. So, And it's, what, $2 maybe, $3? So it's a, it's a good way, if you're interested in learning microcontroller programming, that's the one that I would suggest you start with. The Arduino Nano. Correct. Oh, by the way, tell your people not to get the Pro Mini because that is cheaper than the Nano, but the Nano Pro Mini does not have the USB connector on it. It makes it very inconvenient to program. Okay, so I'm writing that down in the show notes for anybody. They should just take a look there and to remind them not to buy the... Nano Pro Mini to get started. Correct. Well, I think that people like me, for example, we go out, we buy an Arduino board. We know we're supposed to use the IDE or something like that to program it, but I'm not sure that we have all the stuff. Do you have a book for somebody that wants to learn Arduino from scratch to be able to apply it to amateur radio projects? What book would you recommend? Well, obviously, I'm going to recommend my own. Um, I have a, a new one that's sold on Amazon called uh, uh, Beginning C for Microcontrollers. And that one covers the Arduino family, but it also co- covers the STM32 family, which is the blue pill. It covers the ESP32 family, which is the one that has the built-in Wi-Fi. And then it also covers the Teensy uh, series from PGR Systems. And all of those can be programmed in the Arduino IDE. So if you learn the Arduino IDE, you can pick and choose the processor that you want to use based on the demands of the project you have in mind. Um, the Teensy is a, just a behemoth when it comes to processing power. And the Nano, of course, is probably at the lower end. The Blue Pill series, the STM32 and the ESP32, are more powerful processors, more memory, more uh, depth of resources, and slightly more expensive. So you can pick and choose, but they all come in the same uh, 
programming in the same environment, which is the Arduino IDE. And that book assumes absolutely nothing about programming. In fact, I hope that the people who read that book don't have any programming experience because I have a very unusual way of teaching programming. And um, you know, I think it works. And I've had a lot of people tell me it works, but um, it is a little different. So not knowing anything about programming is actually a good thing in this case. Now, do you think that using a book with a cover that sits on the desk is the way to still learn how to program? Well, it is a way to learn. I'm not saying, and I don't think anybody would ever say that it's the ideal way to learn because it's really nice if you're programming, you run into a a roadblock and you can turn to your left and ask somebody, um, what am I doing wrong? That's always beneficial. But in the absence of that, um, there are a lot of books out there on C. Mine's only one of them. But what I try to do in the book is anticipate the roadblocks you're going to run into. And in fact, I will say, you know, what happens if this happens? What do you do? And then I'll tell them what they can do to get around that that roadblock. Now, in 2021, there's a lot of programming languages, I think, that could be applied towards this technology. Do you think that C is still, at least in the way that you look at the universe, is still the best language for this? Well, obviously, I think so. But, you know, there's there's a lot of other languages that are uh, very popular right now. Java, for example, is very popular if you're doing anything on the web. The advantage of C is, first of all, it's limited to 32 keywords. And keywords are just something that means something to the compiler. Other languages, for example, Visual Basic uh, from Microsoft has over 400 keywords. So just becoming familiar with what the language has to offer is a daunting task in some languages. C is nice in that it moved all of the input output statements into the standard C library. So you had the core language sitting by itself and the IO capabilities off in a library. And that's one of the reasons why anytime a new processor comes out from any company, I don't care, Intel, uh, AMD, whatever, one of the first things they do is they bring up a C compiler on that new machine, that new architecture. So knowing C makes it easy to kind of keep up with the times because one of the first things that they do with any new technology is they seem to implement a C compiler for it. And in fact, there's a compiler called YAC, yet another C compiler that um, is portable uh, between almost any processors. And part of the reason is, is because it's divorced the I.O. capabilities from the actual core part of the language. So a person that might be listening to the podcast who might be looking to make a change in career, maybe that career is doing some programming for controllers, learning C from your book might be a way to maybe reignite a new career and at least make a change. It's exactly right. One time I was giving a a paper out at a conference in San Francisco, and um, it was a software development conference. And I was on, I was at the airport, the San Francisco airport, getting ready to fly home. And a guy came up to me and thanked me for the C programming guide. And I said, well, you know, you're welcome. He said, no, you don't understand. He said, I was working three jobs to keep food on the table uh, for my family. And because of the book, I was able to switch careers. I now have a job that pays me twice what those three jobs pay me but I only have one job and I'm able to spend time with my family. So like we were talking about the high school counselor and the impact that had things like that being stopped in an airport and have somebody tell me a story like that just about brings tears to my eyes. What a great story. You're now the contributing editor at CQ magazine with a quarterly column in that magazine. I think you told me that your first installment comes in the November CQ. Could you tell us a little bit more about what your responsibilities are now at CQ magazine? Well, I, I talked with uh, Rich, and Rich is the editor at, Rich Molson is the editor Molson at, at CQ Magazine, and we've been talking about doing a column for quite some time, and the reason that I approached him was there are, unlike 
programming back in the 80s and 90s, there were magazines dedicated just to programming. But it seems that there's nothing, uh, no resource available for programming, especially in the ham radio environment. So I asked Rich if he would let me write a quarterly column that would address issues that might be useful to ham radio operators. And he thought about it and said, yeah, let's give it a shot. So that's what we're doing. And so my job is to assume that the reader has zero programming experience, but has a problem that they want to tackle. And I'm going to try and teach them how to do that. So that's more or less what it's about. What's the current rig? Uh, actually, <laughs> I have a Flex 6400 on, on the desk gathering dust. But I'm also using, I use Hans QCX a lot. And I don't, I don't use the Mini as much as the QCX. And this is weird. The reason is, is because the QCX that I have has a micro switch on it that I can use as a keyer. And I actually really like really like that little micro switch uh, for sending Morse code. And then on field day, uh, the last field day, I actually have a a Zygu G90 that I took to the field to see if 15 watts on single sideband could do anything during something as busy as field day. And actually 15 watts is enough power to get some contacts. So Most of the stuff I do now is uh, low-power QRP operating, but the Flex is a terrific uh, transceiver, and I will use that uh, like I used it uh, this weekend um, on the uh, single sideband contest. Does the 6400 have the front panel? It does not. You're controlling it with a PC. Right. They have have a sub software package that goes with it. And one of the reasons that I bought the 6400 versus some of the other flavors is because they have an API, an application programming interface. And if I want to write my own SDR code, I can do that. So that's another reason why I didn't buy Maestro, which is the front end part that actually you can run separately or integrate it into the the Flex. The idea is that maybe someday I'll, I'll write my own receiver part for it. We were talking at the beginning before we pushed the record button about the Elgato push buttons. There's a great opportunity to use those Elgato push buttons with the flex. That's absolutely true. It gives you a lot of flexibility that you wouldn't have otherwise. Half a maestro. Half a maestro. Yeah, you're probably right. There is a good CAD interface though with the flex and you could expand on that as well. And Hans has added CAD control to the QCX series. And uh, I don't know how he fit everything into that uh, Arduino. Well, it's it's actually the Atmel 328P uh, chip. And it's only got 32K of memory. And he's he's got everything from test equipment to um, a really very efficient CW decoder built into that thing. I don't know how he did it. What's the antenna array on your house? That's kind of funny. I'm on about three acres here, so I have plenty of room for a nice antenna. But I also have a, an XYL who doesn't like antennas. So I'm running a stealth the stealth mode NVID half-wave stuck between the house and a tree. That's it. And how does that perform for you? Actually, I'm very, very happy with it. Um, I work DX when I, when I want to, and I can reliably communicate by uh, CW with just as little as five watts. So yeah, I'm very happy with it. You know, Tim Deegan, KJ8U, was my guest in QSO Today, episode 334. And he coined a term, propagation ham. That's the ham radio builder that puts the project on the air just to make sure that it works and then goes back to the bench. What kind of ham are you? I love to build... I have a lot of test equipment. I'm not that good with it, but I have a lot of test equipment. I want to learn electronics and things like uh, SWR and standing wave ratios, um, propagation. All of that interests me very, very much. And Al, my cohort in crime, uh, ACHGY, is very, very good. He's a, a, a 
actually he's a physicist, but he's a brilliant double E type guy too. And he's had enough patience to kind of drag me along uh, learning all this stuff. So I would say that I'm probably a hands-on, not an appliance operator. I love to dig around inside of things and, and mess around with it. We will return to our guests in just a moment. A new way to show your support of the QSO Today podcast is to buy me a coffee. I consume gallons of coffee to create this weekly podcast. Invite me for coffee by pushing the yellow button, buy me a coffee, on the QSO Today show notes page. And now back to our QSO Today. Now, you gave a presentation with Al in the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo last August 2021, where you were presenting a assuming Arduino-based, single-sideband CW software-defined transceiver. How did that project come to your attention and innovate? That project came about because we wanted to have a software-controlled receiver that didn't require us to drag a laptop or a PC or a tablet into the field. So we started looking at what's available And the reason I bought the G90 was because it does have a small display on it and doesn't require you to take anything else with you. Um, But the display is about an inch and a half across, and that's for old people like me, that's tough, pretty tough sledding. So we sat down and Al uh, and I designed what we would like to have for what we're calling a trunk portable uh, transceiver. And we call it trunk portable because it it weighs about, it's going to end up weighing about 10 pounds with battery and uh, uh, heat sink on it. It's going to be, well, it is, it's a 20 watt transceiver, 80 through 10 meters, uh, no digital mode, just CW and single sideband. Um, it can actually put out 35 watts on 80 and 40, but it drops to 20 watt 25 watts on 20 meters and 20 watts on 15 and i think it's 12 watts on 10 so we're calling it a 20 watt transceiver and it has a five you can pick a five inch seven inch or nine inch display we are not using a touch screen because we don't like poking at the screen while we're operating and that's why we have that matrix of 16 switches for the menus that you most often use when you're using it on the air. And um, it's going to cost about, depending on the display you get, our target is $200. And that's buying all new parts. If you have a junk box with some stuff in it, it's going to be less than that. And we're calling it the T41 EP. And EP stands for Experimenters Platform. We are encouraging Uh, builders to experiment with what we've built. Um, Al's not a professional electrical engineer and I'm not a professional, well, I'm no longer a professional software developer. So we know that there's room for improvement in what we're doing. The right now, the software has about 11,000 lines of C code in it. And I'm using less than 3% of the flash memory in the, uh, C 4.1, which is the microcontroller that's driving it. So there's plenty of programming resources. Al has moved all of the electronic design to 100 by 100 or smaller boards so that you can get take advantage of the uh, specials that most PCB uh, board houses have. And there are seven boards, and like the main board, uh, the power amp, preamp, RF amp, and so forth audio board, all of those are unpluggable and you can plug your own design in it. Plus there's a lot of test points on it uh, where you can test things and see how they're performing. So that came about then from a uh, desire to have a standalone uh, reasonably powered, we call it fuzzy QRP uh, transceiver available to work in the field. And you can dial it down. If the contest requires five watts or less, you can dial it down to five watts. But uh, with 20 watts on single sideband, uh, you can work the world. When I had that feed field day running 15 watts with the G90, I worked, uh, see, Spain, Portugal, France, 
in Germany with a, a really bad antenna um, out in the field. So it can be done. And a lot it just depends on propagation. Now, do you have a GitHub site or something like that that you're using as a way to make this an open source project? Yes. We have a site called Software Controlled Ham Radio, all one word. Software Controlled Ham Radio is the website where we announce things. We have over 2,000 members on that site now, and they will, they are free to talk. I monitor it daily, but uh, other than politics and religion, uh, just about anything goes on there that has to do with uh, microcontrollers. So that's the website that we are using for announcing things uh, relative to the T41. You know, at least since I got back into ham radio more actively about 10 years ago, the magnetic loop antennas have advanced the consciousness of many hams, I think, because of maybe the promise of how they operate in urban environments. You have a magnetic loop project in your backyard. How did that evolve and how was that accepted? Actually, that was um, Al moved from a private home to a neighborhood. Actually, Al li only lives about a half a mile down the road from me. But he's in an HOA, and we started investigating magnetic loops together when he was anticipating making the move to the HOA new home, which he did. And uh, so we started playing around, and Al's research discovered that um, loops that are parallel to each other, which we call the double-double, um, can get very, very... Uh, good efficiencies, over 90%. So we have designed a magnetic loop that's about three feet in diameter. And uh, it has a remote controller that drives either an air variable uh, capacitor or a vacuum uh, variable cap. It's microcontroller um, based. And we've tried it to 75 feet of feed line and control line, and it works very, very well. We used it at field day two years ago, and uh, it works very, very well. One of our friends, who's also in an HOA, has it sitting on his screened-in porch, and he's working DX with it. So uh, it's a pretty efficient design. Uh, not the easiest thing to build, but it, it works very, very well. I saw that you're actually using a large capacitor at the bottom of the loop and not a vacuum variable capacitor that you'd use if you were operating, you know, 100 watts or more into the antenna. How much power are you running at the antenna, and did you build the capacitor yourself? We did not build the ca uh, capacitor. We bought that at uh, a flea market up at uh, Hamfest in Dayton. Um, <clears throat> I can't remember what the gap spacing is, but Al has run that at 200 watts, and uh, it works for you know, just fine. There's no arcing in the capacitor. I also picked up at the same show up in Dayton, a small vacuum variable cap that's really half the size of your fist. And uh, it can handle the 200 watts as well. So the, the project, the double double mag loop can use either an air variable or a vacuum variable capacitor. We we don't really care which one you use. What I saw was that you guys also built an Arduino-based controller for adjusting it. Does it adjust the tuning of the antenna automatically based on the frequency and band? Okay, sort of. What happens is, if you look at that controller carefully, you'll see it's about a two-inch display. And one of the plots that you can do is the standing wave ratio. And so what you do is the first time that you run it, you adjust that those tuning uh, controls to get the minimum SWR, which 80, well, no, that's not right. 40, 20, and 15, uh, we can get it down below 1.2 to 1 um, by using those controls. What's interesting is that once you have set it, in other words, once you've got it tuned and you press the set button, we record the settings on the capacitor and the frequency in um, EEPROM. So if you go back and tune to that frequency, the first thing the code does is go out and read EEPROM, see if there's anything in the neighborhood of where you're currently parked. 
And if so, it automatically sets the capacitor, it rotates the capacitor through a stepper motor uh, to that setting. And then you can fine tune it if need be with uh, the controls on the, on the panel. And from an operational standpoint, if you compared it to maybe the long wire antenna or a dipole, in an urban area, is that antenna quiet? It's very quiet. Um, it, Al and I are both running in fed half waves um, as well as, well, we, we're not using the mag loop. <laughs> Al sold the last mag loop, loop to another ham. So we don't actually have one that we're using. Our friend is still using it. But um, one of the things that we really did notice was uh, how quiet uh, the mag loop is compared to the NFED half wave, and even more so compared to the uh, vertical. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, you were involved with Dr. Gordon Gibby, KX4Z, who's a ham, and our friend Asher Farhan, VU2ESE, on an open source ventilator control system. I actually read a lot of the Arduino conversation that went back and forth on whether to build that or not and how that project might have gone. What happened with that project in the end? Gordon Gibby took um, took the project, submitted it to FDA, and it went into the bowels of FDA, and I'm not sure if it ever came out. It turns out that the ventilator demand that was anticipated, we all of us, and well, I can't say that, but I jumped into it because Farhan uh, was very, very concerned about uh, COVID-19 in India because I think he said we have like, what, uh, a billion plus population and something like 15,000 ventilators. So I jumped in on the project because of my relationship with Farhan and knowing that he needed some help with the software. So He and a bunch of other people worked primarily on the hardware, although obviously he worked on software as well. And uh, together we got this thing working and Gibby had it set up on his coffee table in his living room. And he had a, he's actually got a video someplace of it running and it was submitted. We filled out all the paperwork to FDA, but the demand for it kind of petered out. And so I honestly don't know what's happened to it. What is the Great Cincinnati Builders Group? That's a um, group that Al and I started. Um, We found out through our ham radio club here in town that there were a lot of people who also enjoyed building stuff. So we, we created that group to serve as a clearinghouse for anyone in the tri-state area. We have members coming from Indiana, uh, Kentucky, and Ohio. And it's a very ad hoc group. We don't have any formal meetings or anything, but someone will get an idea for a project and um, we'll run it up and see if it happens. The first thing that we did was the um, uh, dummy load, um, the 100 watt dummy load project that also read out the uh, power going into the, that was on the cover of one of the QST magazines. But anyway, we got together, we do bulk buying so we can reduce the cost down. We get some discounts if we buy enough units. And we have, I think we have 87 members right now. Do you think that building electronic construction in ham radio is passe? No. There are a lot of what uh, you and I might call appliance operators who are just interested in making contacts. And that's fine. I mean, that's what the hobby is about. But there is so much more that the hobby can be if you explore other avenues. And one of them is building. And then even further digging further down into the building aspects, you'll find out that now there's a lot of projects centered on microcontrollers. And the whole purpose of a microcontroller is to make the building easier. Um, What used to be done all in hardware is now done in software, and that's very easy to change, whereas breadboarding new hardware is much more difficult. So part of my job is to convince people that even though they don't know any programming, um, it's a viable pursuit for anyone. And, you know, once you see the the nano blinking the lead on your on your own and you wrote the code for it, um, we pretty much got you. It's, um, 
it's a new area of ham radio that I think is uh, very, very interesting. It's my understanding that perhaps you and Bill Mara of the Solder Smoke podcast differ in terms of what the definition of homebrew is in amateur radio. In your mind, what is homebrew in amateur radio to you? Bill probably has the right definition. Homebrew is uh, something like Pete Giuliano would do or Asher or Hans, where they have the, the brains and the wherewithal to sit down, design something and build it. Or they can take a schematic and throw together a printed circuit board or you know a perf board and build it themselves. That is the true definition in my mind of what homebrew is. But I also think the person who orders a kit from Hans and builds the kit, and when it doesn't work, uh, has to fix it, that person to me is also sort of a homebrew person, but at a slightly less elevated level, perhaps. Or maybe that's a stepping stone towards becoming a home brewer. Because when you start with kits, you kind of have to learn what they are as you're going. I guess it depends on how you build it. You know, if you build it one stage at a time and test each stage, then I think that you may learn how to understand how the design works. It's exactly right. And Al is very, very good uh, on that approach. Um, he, watching him... You know, I've had more more than my fair share of kits that I've built that didn't work. And I could probably spend a couple of weeks and stumble through and actually get it to work. But I can take it over to Al, and literally in 15 minutes, he can identify what the problem is. And in another two minutes, it's fixed. And watching him work and watching anybody who knows what they're doing work is a real joy. And what I find interesting is that their debugging techniques really aren't that much different than the debugging techniques we use in software. It's a divide and conquer type of uh, approach to things. I just um, am not very good at the electronics end. I've learned a lot from Al, but I have a lot uh, lot more to learn. But you're right, Um, building a kit and then trying to figure out what's wrong when it doesn't work kind of elevates you towards the bottom of the next rung on the ladder. And uh, obviously the goal is to progress up that ladder as far as you can. What do you think the greatest challenge facing amateur radio is now? To me, the thing that worries me the most is attracting new members, young people. Um, One of the things that I did, we had a field day in 2015, my club did. And there was, I would guess, a 12 or 13-year-old there. And he went to our go-to station, get-on-the-air station. Um, And for probably an hour and a half, he was talking to people all over the country and just so excited. It was amazing. And his mother came to pick him up. And he went over, and he couldn't tell her fast enough how exciting this was, you know, and everything. And his eyes were the size of hubcaps. And then she looked at him. She says, well, I'm sure it's a wonderful hobby, but where are you going to get the thousands of dollars it takes to get the radio? And it was like she shot him. Um, he was just crestfallen. So part of my mission recently has been to, in fact, the first article I wrote for QST was on taking a cheap kit, in this case, the 49er, and putting a small two-line LCD display on it with a VFO and keeping the cost under $50 so someone could get on the air on a lawn mowing budget. And I want to, I'm not saying cost is the only thing that keeps young people out of it, but it's it's a factor. And the other thing that we hear a lot, um, my club gives the exam every month except Christmas. And um, A lot of people will come in, they take the exam, and we never see them again. And I did run into one of the guys, I recognized him, and I asked him if, you know, he was still active on the air. And he said no. He he got his tech license, and he was using a a handheld. And he said, "Um, I don't see the point, because anything that I can do with a ham radio, I can do with my iPhone. Well, he's missed what ham radio is about. So I think we have... Two missions. One is 
attract younger hams into the hobby. And number two, make a distinction between talking to people and making a contact via ham radio. Those are two different things. And we have done a very poor job of selling that difference. Well, maybe the GOTA stations at Field Day, maybe there should be a display of rigs like Hans rigs and your rigs under $100. I don't know about you, Jack. Lawn mowing budgets are a lot higher than they were in the 50s. <laughs> yeah, they are. And a lot of parents are willing to invest in something like ham radio for their kids. So you're right. That's true. And I did take the 49er to the 2016 field day with a sign, build this radio for under $50. And that did draw a lot of attention. So um, there are things that we can do as existing hams to attract younger hams. Um, Going into the high schools and talking to uh, different uh, classes like a physics class or maybe a math class or whatever uh, would be other things that uh, might be able to get a foot in the door, at least with the young people. Do you think we could do a better job of following up after someone takes an exam? Absolutely. Um, We are now, we just started this, so it's too soon to tell because we've only had two uh, test periods since COVID started. So it's a new program. But what we're doing is we're giving everyone who successfully gets their ticket a free one-year membership to our club. And so far, We haven't had a lot of takers, but we haven't had a lot of people come through taking the exam because of the COVID-19. But um, I'd say we have four people now who have come back uh, to the meetings. We'll have anywhere from uh, five to, is I think the highest we've ever had in one month is 20 people. But part of that's a little misleading because the University of Cincinnati if you're do, taking their RF um, electronics course, you have to have a ham radio license. So we get a lot of students from uh, since the University of Cincinnati who come up to take the exam just for that specific reason. They don't have any intent of really becoming a ham radio operator. Do they have a ham radio station at the university? Yes, they do. Most of the people who come in to take the exam, though, are techs, and they have a handheld, and that's about as far as they seem to go with it. What excites you the most about what's happening in ham radio now? You know, I, th- I think we're kind of jaundiced uh, in terms, think back, well, if you can, think back to 40 years ago, what ham radio equipment looked like, and look at the same thing today. What I have sitting on my desk would have occupied half a basement um, 40 years ago, and things have gotten smaller. Feature set has enhanced terrifically. Uh, Things like software-defined radios where you can see where the signals are and and just tune down and find somebody to talk to is so much better than blind tuning around and hoping you hear somebody. Um, There's been a lot of technological change that, that I think makes the current equipment, much better, much easier to use and more effective. What advice would you give to newer returning hams to the hobby? I think the the thing, everybody has a different goal. In our club, there's a very, very active knot of people who are very, very interested in the repeater end of it. There's another knot who is very interested in FTA in uh, the digital modes. There's another knot who are like me and enjoy building as much as operating. And then there's a small small group, maybe larger than most of the other sub knots, who just simply like operating. They'll get on the air and just chit chat with people all over the country. So I think the, the wisest thing is to find out what's available. If you've been away from ham radio and you're coming back to it uh, over some period of time, I think the first thing to do is to investigate what's new. A lot of people didn't even know that digital modes existed 10 years ago when they left the hobby and they've come back and uh, they don't know about FT8 or any of the other digital modes. So I think the first thing to do is to tell them to explore what their options are, find out what really excites them, jump in and learn about it and get on the air with it. 
Well, Jack, I think that's great advice. And I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. I also want to thank you for your contribution to the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo. It was an amazing presentation. A link to that will be in the show notes pages for the listeners if they want to go back and look at that. And with that, I want to thank you so much and wish you 73. Thank you, Eric. Same to you, and I appreciate the opportunity. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Jack. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in W8TEE in the search box at the top of the page. My thanks to ICOM America for its support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of ICOM America by clicking on their banner in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any other episode into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages or use my Amazon link before shopping at Amazon. Amazon gives me a small commission on your purchases while at the same time protecting your privacy. I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as I head towards episode 400. QSO Today is now available in the iHeart, Radio, Spotify, YouTube, and a bunch of other online audio services, including the iTunes Store. Look on the right side of the show notes pages for a listing of these services. You can use the Amazon Echo and say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. My thanks to Ben Bresky, who edits every single show and allows both this host and my guest to sound brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Until next time, this is Eric. 4Z1UG73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.